Perhaps now it will be asked, how, when all this has been already done, there can be any great wall left behind? I will explain this, O Romans, for this does not seem an unreasonable question. At first Mithridates fled from his kingdom, as Media is formerly said to have fled from the same region of Pontus, for they say that she, in her flight, strewed about the limbs of her brother in those places along which her father was likely to pursue her, in order that the collection of them, dispersed as they were, and the grief which would afflict his father, might delay the rapidity of his pursuit. Mithridates, flying in the same manner, left in Pontus the whole of the vast quantity of gold and silver, and of beautiful things which he had inherited from his ancestors, and which he himself had collected and brought into his own kingdom, having obtained them by plunder in the former war from all Asia. While our men were diligently occupied in collecting all this, the king himself escaped out of their hands. And so grief retarded the father of Media in his pursuit, but delight delayed our men. In this alarm and flight of his, Tigrons, the king of Armenia, received him, encouraged him while despairing of his fortunes, gave him new spirit in his depression, and recruited with new strength his powerless condition. And after Lucius Lucullus arrived in his kingdom, very many tribes were excited to hostilities against our general. For those nations which the Roman people never had thought either of attacking in war or tampering with, had been inspired with fear. There was, besides, a general opinion which had taken deep root, and had spread over all the barbarian tribes in those districts, that our army had been led into those countries with the object of plundering a very wealthy and most religiously worshipped temple. And so, many powerful nations were roused against us by a fresh dread and alarm. But our army although it had taken a city of Tigrons's kingdom, and had fought some successful battles, still was out of spirits at its immense distance from Rome, and its separation from its friends. At present I will not say more, for the result of these feelings of theirs was, that they were more anxious for a speedy return home than for any further advance into the enemy's country. But Mithridates had by this time strengthened his army by reinforcements of those men belonging to his own dominions who had, assembled together, and by large promiscuous forces belonging to many other kings and tribes. And we see that this is almost invariably the case, that kings when in misfortune easily induce many to pity and assist them, especially such as are either kings themselves, or who live under kingly power, because to them the name of king appears something great and sacred. And accordingly he, when conquered, was able to accomplish what, when he was in the full enjoyment of his powers, he never dared even to wish for. For when he had returned to his kingdom, he was not content, though that had happened to him beyond all his hopes, with again setting his foot on that land after he had been expelled from it, but he even volunteered an attack on your army, flushed as it was with glory and victory. Allow me, in this place, O Romans, just as poets do who write of Roman affairs, to pass over our disaster, which was so great that it came to Lucius Lucullus's ears, not by means of a messenger despatched from the scene of action, but through the report of common conversation. At the very time of this misfortune, of this most terrible disaster in the whole war, Lucius Lucullus, who might have been able, to a great extent, to remedy the calamity, being compelled by your orders, because you thought, according to the old principle of your ancestors, that limits ought to be put to length of command, discharged a part of his soldiers who had served their appointed time, and delivered over part to Glabrio. I pass over many things designedly, but you yourselves can easily conjecture how important you ought to consider that war which most powerful kings are uniting in, which disturbed nations are renewing, which nations, whose strength is unimpaired, are undertaking and which a new general of yours has to encounter after a veteran army has been defeated. I appear to have said enough to make you see why this war is in its very nature unavoidable, in its magnitude dangerous. It remains for me to speak of the general who ought to be selected for that war, and appointed to the management of such important affairs. I wish, O oh Romans, that you had such an abundance of brave and honest men, that it was a difficult subject for your deliberations whom you thought most desirable to be appointed to the conduct of such important affairs, and so vast a war. But now, when there is Nius Pompeius alone, who has exceeded in valour, not only the glory of these men who are now alive, but even all recollections of antiquity, what is there that, in this case, can raise a doubt in the mind of any one? 
for I think that these four qualities are indispensable in a great general, knowledge of military affairs, valor, authority and good fortune. Who, then, ever was, or ought to have been, better acquainted with military affairs than this man? Who, the moment that he left school and finished his education as a boy, at a time when there was a most important war going on, and most active enemies were banded against us, went to his father's army and to the discipline of the camp, who, when scarcely out of his boyhood, became a soldier of a consummate general, when entering on manhood, became himself the general of a mighty army, who has been more frequently engaged with the enemy, than any one else has ever disputed with an adversary. Who has himself, as general, conducted more wars than other men have read of? Who has subdued more provinces than other men have wished for, whose youth was trained to the knowledge of military affairs, not by the precepts of others, but by commanding himself, not by the disasters of war, but by victories, not by campaigns, but by triumphs. In short, what description of war can there be in which the fortune of the Republic has not given him practice? Civil war, African war, Transalpine war, Spanish war, promiscuous war of the most warlike cities and nations, servile war, naval war, every variety and diversity of wars and of enemies, has not only been encountered by this one man but encountered victoriously, and these exploits show plainly that there is no circumstance, in military practice which can elude the knowledge of this man.